Before we open it up for our Q&A to the audience, um, I have a couple of questions that I want to kick off with uh, the panel. Um, two follow-up items, um, and then one for the panel as a whole. Uh, first, Dr. Colvis, uh, you mentioned that collaboration seems to play an important role um, in drug development, and specifically for drug uh, repurposing. At the same time, um, you know, it, it appears that through committees, uh, it may slow, slow the process. So in your opinion, how does drug development by collaboration affect the process? So, um, so, so particularly like in the, in the first example that I actually gave, um, the, the areas of disease that actually were being pursued that, that we were providing the funding for um, wouldn't even have um, occurred. Actually, one of, our, one of our better known studies was actually a study where um, it was an AstraZeneca um, uh, drug. It was a, a sarcinase inhibitor that they had been developing for cancer and that they had explored in all different types of cancers. Um, and we had an investigator um, who had um, identified that as a potential target for um, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And um, at that time, that idea was so fresh and so new to actually, to actually pursue kinases as a potential um, target for, for Alzheimer's disease that uh, it, it wasn't even on the company's radar yet. And, and obviously, if he was correct, they would stand to benefit tremendously. We would be happy, he would be happy, we would all be happy. Um, it, it worked beautifully in animals, unfortunately. It didn't work when we got to humans, which is, um, you know, which is a story that we're very familiar with. Um, so, so in that particular program, it ends up being very, just very important because it, when the company is willing to actually open its cabinets and, and let other people come to them with ideas, um, we do have a shot at giving life now to these to these um, to these dormant um, drugs. Um, in the case of in the in the second scenario uh, where it is um, where people are actually collaborating with our scientists, um, what we've heard I think throughout the day is that particularly with academia. They just don't know how to get through that process. They don't quite know how to get from their to get their discovery to a clinical trial. I think you know. I mean, every researcher, every basic researcher that I've ever spoken to, they're all doing it because they do hope that someday they, they will make a difference, um, that what they're doing is going to actually make a difference in human health. And, um, but I think that, that, and as a form of basic researcher myself, you know, but you always thought that, but somebody else was gonna do it. And so, so when they come to us actually, we are able to sort of fill that knowledge gap for them of, we know how to do this, we're very experienced in doing this. So ironically, rather than having a collaboration where you, you, you know, coming together and it takes time to come to an agreement about these various things, I think that uh, even though we don't give any money, we actually give better than money because we do have this experience and we actually can get them through all of the, the studies that they're going to need in order to be able to walk away with an IND faster than if, they, than if we had given them money and they tried to figure this out on their own. And so I think that um, in a way it's sort of, um, instead of having a trial platform, it's sort of having the preclinical platform of, of being able to do that. And so I think that that's really um, where we actually end up finding efficiencies through collaboration rather than, uh, rather than sort of inefficiencies that, that I think a lot of times we think of when you're going to bring a bunch of people together and try to make decisions as a committee. Thank you for that. And a follow-up question for Dr. Roche. Um, you had mentioned um, your problems and your issues and, and where you'd like uh, assistance and uh, would love to hear more about you know, how to build efficiencies in common interest areas and how the Department of Defense could potentially partner with other U.S. government agencies, academia, and, and industry to address some of those issues. Thank you. Um, well, I, the first thought that comes to mind is um, 
next month come down to Florida because we will have um, uh, our once a year uh, military health system research symposium. So you're going to see um, 3,000, 4,000 uh, scientists within DOD, academia, industry to um, come and present their work, um, exchange ideas um, in the different uh, portfolios that I, uh, that I, that I talked about. Um, so that's one thing you can, um, you, you can do. You can come, um, hear about our problems, discuss our problems with uh, your fellow colleagues who we're already partnering with. Um, so I, I, offer that, um, I offer that to you. If you're interested, just, just Google MHSRS 2019. It, it'll just pop right up. You can see everything that, everything that we do. Um, we we have a considerable investment um, uh, that goes um, out into um, extramural uh, competition. And uh, those are largely done through program announcements, um, uh, largely through grants.gov. Grants um, most of them um, come out of um, the Army, which we use to put out most of our uh, our, most of our program announcements. So um, the the volume of um, uh, of funding that we put out every every year is probably close to a billion and a half of um, R and D money that's um, that's put out um, for extramural competition. Um, and and so I'll add a few topics to that because. Um, uh, in our annual president's budget request for biomedical sciences, uh, we're request about 700 million, um, and we we'll get um, from our appropriation about two billion. Congress marks this up a lot, so you can add on a lot of line item ads that we get for breast cancer, prostate cancer. Um, Duchenne's, uh, you know, a, a number of line line items that, that we get. Most of that is, once again, um, uh, we put out on the street for open competition. So that's how you can, um, that's how you can partner with us and, and collaborate with us. And like I said, most of our funding is um, done extramurally. So we depend on academia and industry to get us where we want to go. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to uh, take it out to the audience members to ask questions. We're going to ask everyone to please go to the microphone. And when you do, uh, please share who you are and where you're um, at, your organization or affiliations, to help the audience know who you are. Go ahead. I'm Gabe Sagai from, from industry. Uh, I'm from Summit Innovation Labs. I'm the chief executive of Summit Innovation Labs in Cincinnati. Uh, my compliments to the panel for uh, outstanding presentation. Very, very energizing. Thank you. My question is uh, to Dr. Rausch. And it's uh, thank you for sharing this uh, great mental gymnastic, the planning that you do. That's, <laughs> that's huge. I was wondering if there was an element in that that anticipates the fatigue and slow recovery of persons in service that contributes to less desirable outcomes, you know, if you have any dimensioning of that. Or, and with that, if you have any programs that would help enhance beyond the physical uh, measures of training, like boot camp, if you have any measures that would really enhance endurance and recovery uh, through bio or chemical means that eventually you would help the mission at the same time also reduce PTSD and others. In other words, faster recovery coupled with endurance, improving the mission. Um, th thanks, for the, thanks for the question. If I, if I, uh, I, I hope, I've, I, hope I under, um, have, have understood your, your, your question. So we, um, in terms of uh, rehabilitation and recovery um, of wounded, ill, and injured uh, service member members, 
we have um, invested uh, a pretty significant amount over the last, uh, I, I'd say, 10 to 12 years. So probably in excess of $200 million in um, just in regenerative medicine alone. Now, there, we have sponsored um, at least three large consortium, consortia uh, focused on regenerative medicine, um, and we, we call them a firm one, a firm two, and, uh, and we just put out a program announcement for a firm three. A firm is the acronym that stands for Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Those awards for a firm one and a firm two, those awards have, um, at least one of the lead principal investigators has been Tony Atala down at Wake. Uh, and he's just done some um, wonderful work. And, and, and although it um, started off as, a, as an investment in basic research, it, um, at least through the first five years of the first award, um, uh, produced um, probably up to 15 candidates for clinical trials. So um, th th that's a pretty good track record in that, in that area of uh, translating out of um, science, out of S&T and, um, and, and into the beginning of, of, of clinical, clinical trials. Um, in terms of um, performance enhancement, um, um, that, that's um, that that's been um, somewhat difficult to uh, for for us to for us to think about. We we for the last uh, nearly two decades have been our, our big focus has been on wounded, ill, and injured. That that's. I mean that's been our life. Um, uh, with with the new administration over the last couple of years, um, uh, we have somewhat shifted our thinking. Not necessarily our priority. We're still pro we're still very much focused on wounded, ill, and injured. But we're also focused on I think what you just asked. How do how do you take a highly functioning individual? Or how do you take a highly functional SEAL team and make them better um, and give them a greater competitive edge? Um, and so that's the things that we're starting to explore with our academic and industry colleagues. Uh, my name is Reed Tuckton. And, um I have no particular bias, uh, I guess is what you're asking, Jennifer. I've been, I'm on the drug development side with small entrepreneurial biotech startups. I'm, I'm major on the insurance side, and I'm heavily involved with the senior leadership at NIH, so I don't know what the hell I am. Um, <laughs> my question is for Steve uh, Galson. Thank you for your presentation. I'm just trying to see how you think through something um, and, and help me to educate me. You showed on slide 11 a very compelling slide which says here's how much money NIH spends on R&D and here's how much the industry spends. Um, arguing that there probably is also some intermingling of those as we discussed in some detail at the beginning of this conversation. The thesis of this meeting in some ways hits to the question that since a lot of money is coming from the public through their taxes for NIH, and that money is leaching over, as it should, to be able to help private sector do what it does. Should that or should it not have some impact on pricing? And so that if you, at the end of the day, have the federal government and the American taxpayers are giving more R&D and making it, in, so let's just say it's twice. If it hadn't been for NIH, it would have been more than twice. There should be some, should there be some awareness of that and to the American people who are paying taxes of which they have very little money to do and then have to pay ever higher drug prices on the back end, should there be some consideration? Secondly, and related to that question, is if, and I think you're absolutely persuasive, that the 
reason that costs are going up so much is because manufacturing is hard. Should there then be a collaborative effort, maybe led by an NIH, spearheaded, collaborated by somewhere that we share manufacturing knowledge across businesses as opposed to each being proprietary manufacturing systems so that the American people will get a break on how much money it costs to buy these wonderful innovations that are being produced. Help me to think through that in the context of why we're here today. Yeah, well, obviously that's a question you're trying to wrap up the entire two days discussion in, in one minute, and it's difficult to do that. I'm not sure what the overall answer is to your question. I think the, the points that I'm trying to make, which is not just manufacturing, but development is very expensive. And yes, there's a big investment from the government, but there's also a huge investment from the industry to get those um, discoveries into the form where they can be actually be tested as a drug and then through the testing process. Um, the, the initial discovery and basic research is just one point. Um, I, I guess what we say in, 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 in Amgen and in, I'm sure it's similar in most companies, our final focus is getting drugs to patients. That's how the American people are mostly benefiting from the work we do, and that's how I feel. Whether um, that should have some impact on the prices, the, the way that drug prices are, are set and then where the money goes of the price, you know, with 40% of every dollar that's paid for a medicine going to an intermediary in the form of the PBM. It's a very, very complicated. Okay, so let me push you a little bit on the manufacturing side, just to be yeah. sure. So if the manufacturing costs are going up, and you were very persuasive with that slide, why is it that we are not then having the private sector come together and say there are commonalities around these challenges? Yeah. Let us then give an agenda to NIH that says help all of us so that we to get past this competitiveness and, 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 and the proprietariness. Let's get to some common solutions for manufacturing techniques. Yeah. Let NIH kind of have a, a portfolio of things and then have the industry be able to say thank you public for helping us to solve it, now we can begin to see some decrease in the manufacturing costs, which we will now see as decrease in price. Why can't we do that? Well, I think there is a lot of collaboration around manufacturing. There are lots of professional organizations that meet and discuss problems. There's a lot of advances that have been made um, with public-private collaboration around manufacturing and development. But the, 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 the connection back to pricing is a very huge jump. I mean, the, the way that drug prices are set is a complicated interplay between the various parts of the healthcare system, and they're not in, we, the, the drug industry isn't in control of them, right? We work through PBMs that get 40% of the money. And so, do we need to do more work on drug pricing? Absolutely. What, there is not an easy solution, though. We, we have a gold standard ecosystem in the United States that's the wonder of the rest of the world that the Chinese and other countries are trying to copy and replicate. And we tinker with that at our risk. Does it need to be um, improved and tinkered with? Yes. But there isn't an easy uh, solution that I can give in 10 seconds. All right. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate uh, it. Can I? I'm going to take it from a completely different industry. Yeah. Okay. In the 80s, I ran a Center for Integrated Manufacturing where we were working with heavyweight manufacturers like Lockheed and General Motors and people like that. And we did, our consortium was strictly on pre-competitive pre stuff, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And the way we did it is every one of our 10 companies gave us $100,000 a year, and for $100,000 a year with 10 companies, they got a million dollars worth of research, okay? That is a real simple return on investment, okay? So what happens is when you're looking at particularly the stuff that's pre-competitive that really doesn't have to do with the drugs or whatever else, that's where you really get the bang for the buck. Because again, you can then say, all of us will kick in a little bit and we'll immediately get a multiplier effect, right? And, and I'll tell you another secret about th this consortium. I ran this consortium, the industry would say, go try this, and it didn't work. And I said, okay. And they come back next year and give me more money. And it didn't work either. Then they came back and they kept giving me money and it never worked. And I finally said, I am missing the point here, guys. So I went to the funders and I said, I, I don't understand. Why do you keep giving me this money? 
And he said, well, we're about to build a $2 billion plant based upon this idea. And if it doesn't work, we're going to be at $2 billion. So giving you $100,000 to test it, piece of cake. That's an easy sell internally. Okay? So a lot of this, particularly if you're talking about the NIH, it should be the testing of how these platforms should be integrated together with the expectation that a lot of them aren't going to work, and that's okay. Okay? Thanks, man. Appreciate it. So on this theme of, of partnerships, I, I want to ask a, a question of the panel, and anyone please chime in. What are your thoughts on how we can um, work with NIH and how NIH can foster more partnerships for drug development? I think um, Lynn is very modest, but the work that she has done uh, with FDA and NIH and nonprofit groups and academia to create dozens of these public-private partnerships over a number of decades are the, these sort of activities, which represent the best in partnership in science, are a huge part of the answer to look, decrease costs decrease uh, replication of effort, but there's a lot of other activities that, that we could do uh, if there was, you know, more funding to the centers like NCATS and, and the part of the FDA budget that goes to these partnerships. So I think there are a lot of things we can do. Um, it's just making sure that we have the, the consensus around that the fact that they're important and not getting distracted by other matters. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make a, a comment on, on that. And so within, within DOD, we, we share many problems, you know, topics that NIH and the VA work on, right? Suicide, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, tra well, not so much trauma for the VA, but um, uh, so w what, what we do is we collaborate heavily with our NIH and, and VA partners. So when, when we do a review and analysis of the traumatic, uh, of the TBI, traumatic brain injury portfolio, and the research that DOD is sponsoring, um, we always have an NIH rep, largely it's Walter Korshetz, who comes, sits on our panel. We have a VA rep. Um, so they present what they're doing, we present what we're doing, um, uh, and, and then uh, we, we understand where the, where the investment, where the science is, what the science is telling us that we're funding, what it isn't telling us, and in many cases, um, it forms the basis of how we can collaborate together. And so, for example, we will um, sponsor with the VA or NIH a, uh, a consortium. We did it in TBI, we did it in PTSD, where we will um, fund so much and the VA will fund so much um, and we'll make a, either a single or two awards. The VA is a little difficult because their whole program is intramural, so it, you, you have to work with them a, a little bit. Uh, but we'll sponsor a consortium, a five-year investment in PTSD, which will be focused on drug development in PTSD. So that's the way we work with our colleagues in NIH and the VA. Others? I mean, I guess I might say that in the, you know, in the same way that the basic scientist is sort of thinking like, I hope, I, hope, I hope my stuff makes a difference at some point, but it's going to have to be somebody else who actually does it. The same thing with these sort of partnerships is that the thing that we've really learned in, in working with, um, with the companies is that the secret really is the people. <laughs> and having a champion within the company that is willing to really, you know, stick with this to, you know, that really believes in the in the cause. It it makes all of the difference. And so, um, you know, when we if we if we do lose somebody because they went off to another company, it it that could end up, you know, sort of unraveling um, the partnership. Um, but the other thing I guess is that, um, you know, I know that, 
you know, Chris, any time that we talk about any kind of, you know, whether it's a partnership with a company or whether it would be a partnership with, um, you know, with an academic group or, or, you know, particularly when we're thinking at the program level, you know, his question is always, but what's in it for them? Why would they do it? And, and, it's, and it's such an obvious question, but I think that um, a lot of, it's so, so easy to think about well, why do I want to do this? How is this going to benefit me, or how is this going to be benefit my organization? If you cannot see what your partner is going to get out of it, it, it you, it's going to make it very, very difficult to establish this collaboration, because it may not even be obvious to them, right? You may have to point that out to them. So, um, so I think that you know, having, having that perspective and then having you know, people who, um, you know, really believe in what it is that you're trying to do and, and who are really going to sort of fight alongside you uh, will make all the difference in whether or not the partnership can actually move, uh, can move forward. So once the partnership is formed, you need people who are professionals at executing it, which means you need people like pro project managers, you need program managers, you need systems engineers. One of the major dilemmas is you have general utility biologists who then say, I'm going to dump you in and now you're going to do all this other process stuff, which they have no training about at all. They don't know how to meet milestones. They don't, I mean, they're just not trained that way. So once you do is you, once you get the partnership, then you need to supply them and explain to them that this is not going to work unless you bring these things. We did a study of NHLBI on successful major clinical trial groups. By far the number one thing was they had a project manager who ran the thing. Because the biologists and the, the scientists did not really know how to manage a project with milestones. It's not in their wheelhouse. So again, once you get started, that's perfect, but then bring all the experts in. Okay. So I'll say that that's, a, that's an excellent point. And, the, and it's really interesting because for scientists who've never worked with a project manager, they're, they're very uh, reluctant. You know, it's sort of, I don't want this person. I, I know what I'm doing I, because they know the science. So I know what I'm doing, and I don't need somebody coming in and telling me what to do and when to do it or, you know, tracking my, you know, my activities or anything like that. But once they get that taste of what it's like to have a really good project manager, I, I think they never want to live without them because mm -hmm. they really can make all the difference in the world in the, in the project and whether or not it, it – and w what it actually does is it relieves them of the mm -hmm. burden of mm -hmm. keeping track of all of that stuff so that they can just focus on the science. Um, it's, it's sort of neat to watch that, that transition happen, actually, when they, when they have that experience. But it's, it's absolutely true, and it's unfortunate because – even for an R01, even if you're not milestone driven, it would just be nice to have that kind of project management for even an R01 type application. It would make it a better and more productive um, project, but it's just not something that's been part of the culture, at least in, in, in the academic culture. Yeah. Well, I, I, we've been able to change the needle just ever so slightly. We got them to um, institute that at NHLBI for the major studies. So they have to have a program plan, which they never had before. So. Great, and we'll kick this back out to the audience. Hi, Diana Pankovich, I'm from Pfizer. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, great panel, it's really interesting to hear the perspective. If I can actually comment on Dr. Tuck, uh, Tuckson's question and then pose kind of a, you know, an idea out to the panel. Um, you know, there are efforts, uh, Transcelerate is one effort, it's cross pharma where, you know, they're doing things around how do we do better autom automation of pharmacovigilance? How do we do better e-labeling? So there's a lot of efforts, but that's a pharma-led effort um, across pharmaceutical companies. And so how do you kind of take pharmas, and yeah, I am speaking from the, you know, as a um, Pfizer policy analyst, but, you know, so how do you take the willingness of pharma, because it's there, it's, it, there's clear evidence to work in you know, pre-competitive space around very critical issues, but then bring in other actors. And the question I think, and I'm trying to, um, and maybe the, you know, the panel has an idea, where do you do that? I mean, NCATS budget is really low, and NCATS has these great ideas, and I've watched over the years, you know, these really cool things happening. Can we do something like the Presidential Innovation Fellows where we bring in those PhDs that went over to industry and, you know, bring them in for two year or three year fellowships and, you know, teach them, you know, teach them in NIH or, you know, find, find another place where F, maybe it's FDA where we can create a true collaborative because I think the challenge right now, and maybe this is turning more into a comment, I apologize, 
I think the challenge is, is there is a lot of willingness and recognition that at the end of the day, this is about the patient. It's about getting drugs, getting safe, effective drugs to people to help them better their lives. So I think everyone in the room agrees that's the end goal, but it's the mechanism finding out the willingness of industry to collaborate, the willingness of NIH to come together. Maybe we do need things like these presidential innovation fellows and say to industry, hey, can you give us 10 scientists for two years to help us do X, Y, and Z. And so I kind of just wanted to do more brainstorming with the panel. Um, but I did want to you know, say there are efforts definitely in specific areas within manufacturing, within clinical trials, where industry is working collaboratively to try and fix a lot of these issues. And I know there's companies, for example, Pfizer as well, that is really trying to, right now we have massive efforts around how to use autom automation and robotics to speed some of our data issues. How do we leverage AI to better hit targets and better modeling? So kind of wanted to throw that brainstorm out. And do you have a specific question you want to ask the panel? I mean, I guess, I guess if we were to imagine, where, where would the place be where we can bring together, truly bring together industry, bring together the regulators, bring together academics, and the patient voice to kind of innovate? Because I feel like there's just a lot of silos right now. So that's kind of, a, you know, maybe I'm missing something that I don't know about. But I guess that's my question. Well, I think there are a lot of activities that you've heard about here, and there's a lot more that you haven't heard about that are underway. They are the, the way to make drug development more efficient, and I think we need to focus more on these kind of pre-competitive uh, collaboration concepts, which it's sometimes challenging for the industry to do, but there is no question with the accelerating costs of development and manufacture that we need to collaborate more. Um, and so I'd like to see more of that. The activities like Transcelerate, CTTI, which is the Clinical Trial Transformation Initiative, and a lot of the things that Lynn talked about, I think those are the ways to make uh, development more efficient in the future. And to switch industries again, uh, MIT ran a leaders in manufacturing program where they went to industry and said, give me a, come your really best people, bring me in for two years, I'll give them a master's degree and learn how to integrate things together. And it was a fabulous idea until all the students graduated and worked for consulting agencies. And then it just all fell apart. It was like the entire intention was you're going to bring it back and then you took the high paying job and we're gone. So. I'm Lana Skirbo. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit unique in my history. I ran the NIH Office of Science Policy for decades, started in kindergarten. And <laughs> <laughs> if you believe that, I'll, I'll sell you Brooklyn Bridge. And um, now I've spent about six or I'm almost, I'm starting my eighth year in industry, and this has been a very interesting transition for me. Um, so the question I have for the committee, and maybe to address what Reed was going at, is the role of NIH in drug development, the purpose of this panel, let's stick to what NIH is good at when you start looking at recommendations. I don't think manufacturing is a place where NIH built an expertise over time, nor do we necessarily wait for NIH funding basic researchers and some clinical researchers to begin to develop a portfolio of manufacturing experts. I think there are areas where NIH can collaborate, and, and Chris and Lynn have talked about that with industry effectively, but I'm not sure manufacturing is the case. Nevertheless, I wonder whether the panel, what the panel thinks of transforming, I'm talking about Janet's talk this morning, Janet had a very clear vision of what was needed. And the question is that are we looking at the wrong place for innovation center. Janet didn't like regulatory science. She liked the name translational science. But I'd like to hear what the committee thinks about rep making recommendations not to NIH for change to improve the costs and, and time of drug development, but whether we need to create funds and, and resources at the Food and Drug Administration to move this area along. So I just, what, what would you think of that as a, as an out-of-the-box idea. 
Okay, I'm going to approach this from Chris's diagram, all right? If you've got to go through all of those steps, which one is underfunded? Which one is undersupported? So if, if you literally have to go, I have no idea how many steps there are. There's more than two, right? <laughs> right? So there's lots and lots and lots of steps, and you say, we really need to focus on X, but that's not really the bottleneck because we don't have enough people in Y and Z. And you're saying, then we, we need to do manufacturing because that's the topic of the day. Come to find out, and I have no idea what your map is, when we actually mapped the manufacturing desires versus what was supported, there were major holes. And it was clearly we could not get there from here given what was happening. And so rather than us say it should be X, somebody should look at it. And my recommendation is look at the map that you put together and say, where are the holes? What are these holes that could be filled effectively by the NIH? What are the holes that we need to give to NIST because they're the manufacturing people, let them do that. And then basically look at the entire system because if it's everybody has to do it, only doing part of it is not going to get you what you want, which is drugs to patients. It's, you're just not going to get there from there. Okay? Hi, uh, Bob Rohr. I'm a freelance biomedical journalist based here in D.C. Come out of a background in AIDS activism. I've served on a number of HI, uh, a number of uh, NIH advisory committees at various levels. My data may be. Uh, a little dated now, but my recollection is that for big pharma, uh, R&D constitutes about 15 percent most of, the, of their total expenditures. So if we're able to cut that in half, basically what the savings we're talking about are one or two years price increases. It's not going to be dramatic. We're also talking about, though, um, small startups where R&D is a substantial part of their total expenditures. And I, I guess what thing that strikes me is that we're talking about pharma and drug development as if it's one thing across the board. And maybe what we need to do is start looking at, you know, the different types of drug development that are going on and adapt to that and, you know, create programs that work for those specific needs. I know some of it's going on now, but I think this advisory committee in particular really hasn't taken uh, broad, broadly acknowledged that and, and shaped their discussions towards those very significant differences between the various segments of pharma. Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're making very good points. It's very difficult to talk about pharma or bio companies as a monolith. They're very, very different. And as the slide, I think you showed that the number of startups, or is that one of which of you, uh, that we saw this morning, the number of startup companies has dramatically increased over the last decade. And one thing that they have in common is lack of experience in how to develop a drug. So they're going to be a lot less efficient, most likely, than the Amgens and the, the, the Roches and the Pfizers, because they haven't done it hundreds of times already. So I think you're making a really good point. There isn't a one-size-fits-all solution to any of these issues that we've been bringing up. Uh, uh, Patricia Danson, the Warden School. Um, I want to follow up on that previous question. Uh, Steve, you showed the the data from the tough studies of the costs of R&D, yes. which are based on, I think, 10 or 11 of the largest companies. Presently, from the ICVIA data, those l very large companies account for less than 20% of the drugs being approved by FDA, and the smallest category of drugs, of companies, account for over 70% of the new drugs coming through the FDA. The very limited data that we have on the costs of R&D in those small companies is that it is dramatically lower than in the large companies. Now, I do believe that part of that is because they're going after different therapeutic categories, and certainly part of it is that some of the very large overhead of the larger companies is getting averaged into the R&D department, the costs of acquisitions is b being built in there, and so the data, it's not an apples to, to apples at all. 
but I think that there is real value in those much lower estimates of the cost for the smaller companies. And so it seems to me that one of the major challenges we have now is coming up with a really representative cost of R&D. Because the fact is, the Tufts approach, using the proprietary data of the companies, is the best approach. But it breaks down when drugs are licensed and out-licensed, as is totally the norm now. So we really don't have a good way of measuring for a representative sample of drugs, for a representative uh, mix of companies, the average cost of R&D. And I'm wondering whether pharma and bio or anyone is thinking about how to move that forward so we are looking at something more realistic than the Tufts numbers. Well, I, I, I agree with everything you've said. We're one of the industry supporters of the Tufts program that I think you know, is continuously working on this issue. I'm not an expert on the data about this comparative uh, cost of R&D of uh, different companies. I can tell you that my first impression just hearing this is that a lot of the small companies have gone o uh, after so-called orphan indications, which of course are much easier to develop than a drug that requires, you know, 30,000 person clinical trial like a cardiovascular drug or an Alzheimer's drug. So that could explain part of it, but they're also, you know, it's fair to say that in large companies that have been doing things for many years, they're not as focused on cost efficiency and how to do things as cheaply as possible as they might be. I know at Amgen I've been involved in many, many efforts over the last eight years to try to cut the costs of uh, doing business, and we've been very, very successful in many different areas from manufacturing to shortening the cycle time and other things that are making a dramatic impact, but that's not to say we don't have more to learn from small companies that are maybe more agile at what they're doing. And you also need to take into account those number of small companies that failed that never got to succeed oh, yeah. due to right. drug. Let's not and, forget and, that. And, and basically, when you look at the hit rate for innovation of new companies, it's abysmal. I mean, what you hope is the one company out of 10 that really does the drug, if all you do is look at their R&D, you've missed the other nine. And so there's, a, there's also a multiplier effect with that. That is true. But if the small companies are forming around the likely uh, successes, which is often the case because they're forming around the products coming out of, out of the universities, then intrinsically it's a very efficient way of getting new drugs to market. Except, uh, again, I don't know anything about drugs, but I know a lot about IT, and I can guarantee you in Silicon Valley the death rate is incredibly high, even though it's all really good, really smart people doing really, really clever things, and they, it just doesn't work. And, and I mean, I, I oh, see yeah. Well, the death rate of these small companies is also very high in, yeah, yeah. in pharmaceutical okay. development, no yeah. question. Yeah. And I mean, the yeah. example I give, I could never figure out that Candy Crush would be a bestseller. <laughs> I mean, really, you know, how many apps are generated and this thing hits? You know, it's like, who knows? Good afternoon. I'm Ian Kramer, Executive Director of the LEAD Coalition. I don't have the benefit of being either an economist or a scientist. I'm just one of those troublesome policy. Not people. even a lawyer? So, <laughs> right. Not that either. So um, uh, uh, a few thoughts. Initially, uh, Dr. Galson, just an enormous thanks from the Alzheimer's community for Amgen's efforts and for those of your your colleagues throughout industry, large and small companies. We know that uh, 16 years without an FDA-approved therapy, either disease-modifying or symptomatic relief, is as hard on you as it is on our community. And we know you're in our corner. Uh, to Dr. Morgo Blue, uh, so a quick Blue. aside there. But um, you know, I'm, I'm quite taken with, with Chris's map, uh, which I'll acknowledge I hadn't seen before. And I, go, I plan to go back this evening and look at the fine print. But it strikes me that this, you know, very much as Dr. Diltz said, is a system problem and there are a lot of pre-competitive opportunities. And, and while I'm quite taken with things like AMP-AD and PDUFA, I understand that they have their limitations, they have their flaws, they have their costs. But I, I find myself wondering, and, and I'll direct this to Dr. Colvin and Dr. Diltz, but Chris might want to chime in. Um, I wonder if there is some version of a PDUFA for NCATs that might make sense, where industry, large and small, could come together, work with NCATs or NIH more broadly, 
and negotiate whether there are some high priority systems change or system improvement opportunities where some level of user fees, in addition to appropriations that those of us in the advocacy community might fight for, might help us achieve some of the kind of system improvements that serve everyone in industry and therefore everyone in government and everyone that will benefit from eventual drug and device discovery and, and those products reaching market in a high uptake kind of scenario. Is, is that at all a viable option for discussion to have a PDUFA light or a PDUFA small in an NCATS, NCATS context? Um, so I think we've never thought of it in terms of, um, of like a user fee type thing. We certainly engage in collaborations with large companies where they do recognize that there's something that we can do that, that either, either they're no longer doing it or it's just it's not a priority or they, they really recognize that they would be able to benefit from us. So, so we've, we've done this in more in an in an in-kind type of exchange than we've ever done it in terms of in terms of um, user fees. So, don't even think we're allowed to do that. So, right. so, so I'm thinking, and again, maybe there are statutory prohibitions that we have to right. unwind from an advocacy point of view. But I just wonder if if that might be in, in a disease agnostic environment like NCATS. Right. And, and a sponsor agnostic way, at least the way PDUFA aims to be, I, I realize it may not always play out that way, where you can get at some of these fundamentals that Dr. Diltz and others have spoken about and that are reflected in Chris's chart. And if I, I understand it's not useful to pick off one, but could you over time, in the same way PDUFA has sought to in its now almost seven iterations over you know, a, a couple of decades, could you pick off a series of strategically industry-wide disease agnostic ways, pick off a series of targets that in an integrated fashion really do change the field in the way that Chris would aspire to but does not yet have the budget to do? Okay, so when we did uh, technical roadmaps for what's called the Integrated Manufacturing, um, IMTR, Integrated Manufacturing Technology Roadmap Initiative, what we broke it up into major sections around goals, and then we said who, who's the best able to do X goal? Okay, and we were looking at things like who's the best able to do build the design systems, and then who's best best able to do integrated manufacturing on the shop floor. Who's the best able to build the databases interface between the two? And we broke them down, and then we said, okay, now who is best within these subsections, and who do we need to look at? And and when you do that, you quickly discover, I don't know anything about this stuff, and I need to go to somebody else. You know, it's somebody else in the government or somebody else, and I just need to talk to somebody else. And, and, but then you also say, this is my, this is my um, basically swim lane. This is where I play. And I'm going to be the best at this. Let's partner with other people who are the best at what they do. Let's talk to each other. And so we're basically in sync so we know where people are going. And the other thing we found out, which was very interesting, is A, there was an enormous amount of common problems that people didn't even talk to each other about. They were just like, really? And they're like, yeah, this is a problem. The other thing, and, and I, I, doubt, I don't know if it deals in, in, in medicine, uh, people can design things that can never be made because it's easy to make stuff on a computer, right? And drove manufacturing people crazy. And so we built in massive feedback loops to say, when you think you've got a cool thing, at least test it. And, and I cannot tell you how many times it was like, you, I mean, you literally physically cannot make it with this kind of material. It just doesn't work. And that way, but you did it early in the design stage so they didn't basically complete a complete prototype of an airplane and come to find out you can't do this with the landing gear, which then impacts everything else, okay? Chris, do you want to say anything about your? Thank you. We're adding to our panel, potentially. <laughs> we can pull up a chair. <laughs> so I, I both want to make a plea for numbers. Um, and not to pick on you, Steve, but I just sort of looked through Amgen's annual reports. And you guys are reporting single digits to low teens cost goods um, as a, a fraction of price. So manufacturing which we've had animated discussions about doesn't seem to be the biggest cost driver. And, you know, I know how hard Amgen has worked to make manufacturing efficient over the years and quality control efficient. It's, you guys have been leaders in that. And, but I'd really like to ask both David and Steve, perhaps, that the system that's engineering is based on knowing your numbers, right? And having looked at 
sector, both from outside and inside. <clears throat> Where would you point your finger at the place that this community could put the most time and energy and scientific analysis to make a difference? Um, finish this, make a difference in what? So this meeting is about price. I mean, I, we could pick a lot of denominators, but you know, that's, that's why this meeting was called. Definitely let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I got nobody back at corporate and go, kick me in. All right. And again, I'm going to be, I'm going to be extreme. And, and Steve, feel free to cut me off at the knees. I have no problem. You have what's called an all fixed case model in accounting. It's all in development. Okay. How much should Microsoft Office sell for? Because it costs nothing to replicate it. I mean, it's zip. But how much did it cost to develop it, and how do I amortize all those other costs back? From what I understand, and I'm definitely not an expert in this, the actual direct cost of manufacturing is pennies, but the actual development cost is incredibly expensive. So you have, in accounting, it's called an all fixed cost case. And then you've got to figure out how to price it, given the fact that you've got to spend all these other massive amounts of money to get the next version. All right? And I have no idea how you guys do this stuff, but if you just look at cost of manufacturing, you're going to run into problems. Now, let me, I'll give you two completely inappropriate characteristics, okay? If you look at how much a woman's bikini costs compared to the cost of the material in it, it's insane. I mean, the prices just has no relationship to how much it costs to make. The second one is, and I actually use this in my class, if it's Christmas time and you go buy a poinsettia at a nursery, you get this nice little green bucket and it's a poinsettia, and here it is, it's $4.99. They add five cents worth of gold foil, and they put five cents worth of red ribbon, and they sell it for $15 at a grocery store, right? The cost marginally related to what the actual sales price is, okay? That's part of the, that's part of the thing where I really empathize. It's really tough to figure out what that should be. Right? I know fact I cannot beat poinsettias and bikinis, so I won't even <laughs> try. Uh, but if you look at all the failures of drug development in experienced hands and you look at all the failures um, of small companies, uh, there is a lot that we still don't know about the human body uh, and how it works and how to cure diseases. So I'm a strong proponent of more research. We, ha we have amazing progress taking place linking uh, diseases and health status to genetic markers uh, and you know I could talk a long time about the research ideas that we have and that are uh, being pursued in many companies uh, around the US and in the world and so I think a lot of the progress that's going to take place in in the future in drug development is going to be the results of more research it's both in basic science and in translational science, how to test uh, drugs more efficiently so that you don't lose so many in the process, how to be able to predict uh, how humans are going to react to the drugs uh, without having to do all the tests. So many of the tools that we've seen with data analysis and, and other ways of using uh, large data sets. So I, I'm strong believer that the, the, the solution to this is more research and more collaboration. Great, thank you. We have about 10 minutes left, um, and I want to use that time to ask one final question uh, for each of the panelists uh, to answer. And that is, what major steps do you feel that the National Academy should recommend to increase the efficiency of clinical research in the U.S.? Well, I think this meeting is great. We, there are a, a large number of activities at the National Academies that, that um, are looking at one uh, part or another of drug development. I participated in the drug forum, and there are lots of expert uh, uh, committees that have been convened uh, throughout the years. The robust ability of NIH and FDA to support these efforts is, is really important. And so, you know, I would encourage the federal agencies that are the main funders of, of the activities here and other groups like the Arnold Foundation to continue to support the kind of study and the kind of discussion 
that we need to get better consensus about how to move forward. Um, somebody earlier said that it's, uh, it's all about relationships. Um, so um, for us, the military health care system, nine, nine million beneficiaries, um, our direct care system is 35 um, major military treatment facilities and hundreds of, 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 of clinics. And so that, that really represents a, um, in terms of clinical research, and in our, in our patient population, um, that really represents an opportunity for academia and industry to partner with us uh, to run clinical trials and run clinical studies in our facilities. And, you know, we have a, we have a number of instruments that that you know we can use to permit things like that, and and we do through cradas and 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 other instruments. So um, uh, you know I, I I would encourage once again it's about relationships, and so I would encourage um, uh, academia and industry to um, partner with our clinical investigators in our military treatment facilities, Walter Reed, San Antonio, Eisenhower, I mean, you know, Madigan, um, and, um, and facilitate uh, exchange of information and develop uh, protocols and clinical studies and trials. Many of you do already, I mean, but we can always use more. I would recommend that the committee uh, urge for more funding, um, more funding not just for NCATS, I think they are definitely underfunded, but more funding for NIH to be able to support investigators to do some of these very basic studies that Janet was talking about this morning that aren't really acknowledged in the top tier journals and it's hard to get tenure for. So a little shift of priorities at NIH, and, but it definitely would need more funding. And the other suggestion would be to get at what Lana Skirball suggested, which is really not only does, could the FDA benefit from more funding to stimulate this, but if there was a pot of money that both NIH and FDA would have to work together for, to get funding for some of these translational activities, that would that would really stimulate. Um, so I feel in a bit of an awkward position to <laughs> to say anything. Here. <laughs> Basically, what Lynn said, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but I would say, I guess, just sort of more more generally, um, I guess anything that would. Um, lead to the empowerment um, of uh, appropriate parties for appropriate roles would be, and, and, and empowerment can take several forms, I think. Um, but I think that that, that, that um, that is probably, you know, the, the best way to actually um, um, I suppose have impact, and then and then more solidly, I guess I would say that I, I think that you know your re your recommendation of sort of you know recognizing and identifying the things that the th there are things that these different sectors are good at. We, we do them very well. We can sort of do them in our sleep almost, and so when you empower those aspects, um, it it will I think bring efficiencies for you know for for everybody um, and and um, because they are the things we're good at we and when I say we I mean for for all the different sectors um, because they are the things that we're good at uh, you know we we will go faster and we do see success you know for for everybody so to me it just you know it just makes sense and have the empowerment go along with that. And again, I get to end. Um, I'm going to be the skeptic. I think you got too much money. Okay? Sorry. Yeah. 
<laughs> and my Mac went outside. Someone cut them off. <laughs> if you're in a munificent environment, you can afford to be ineffective. Okay? When you're squeezed, that's when you really got to figure out how to do it better. Okay? Because you don't have the extra resources to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't fund the resources, but the fact is you can be most organizations in a... I'm not going to pick on you, but I could pick on you, can be incredibly wasteful just because you got a lot of money coming in, and then the money stops, and then, oh my goodness, we really got to tighten down and figure out where all the inefficiencies are, okay? I absolutely guarantee you the NIH wastes at least a billion dollars a year in inefficiencies, and that's a really simple, easy estimate, okay? That's not breaking a sweat. So number one is I would recommend you get more efficient. Number two is I'm going to come back to the diagram again. If that's really what it takes to get the ultimate goal which is better treatment, whether it's preventative or whatever, to the patients, then you need to look at it holistically. And then holistically, what should the NIH do? What should the NIH not do? What part of this is the FDA's responsibility? What part of it is somebody else's responsibility? And then sit there and say, we need to have a high-level collaboration that's got all these sub-collaborations underneath it, and then that's how we get the biggest bang for the buck. Then, by the way, then when you go back and talk about what's the price of drugs, we can clearly show this is what we've contributed, which is now you have a lot stronger hand to say, hey, this is what we've done. I want to thank our panelists uh, for sharing their expertise um, and their, or their depth and breadth of experience and knowledge. Uh, we thank you for your time um, on this panel, especially on behalf of the planning committee, of which Steve also uh, serves on with me. Um, so please uh, join me in a round of applause to thank our panelists.